quite busy. Um, okay, so as you can see from my cover slide, my, my name is Katie Whitaker. Uh, thanks to Lorna and Alison for having me. Um, it's nice to be able to speak at TAG rather than always sit in the audience. I feel like I have slightly more exercise than usual. Um, mine is an archaeological take on this theme. And my cover slide, it gives my, my title, Failure is Not Fatal, it's the silicosis that will kill you, uh, because I'm going to be speaking about the historical sarsenstone quarrying industry in North Wiltshire. And the quarrymen often died young from silicosis, because sarsenstone is nearly 100% silica. It's usually something like 97 or 98% silica. So it's a really nasty material to work with. This work is a work in progress. Um, it's the beginnings of a piece of work that's relevant to my PhD at the University of Reading. Uh, and by all means, if you're so inclined, please do tweet about it if you're so moved. There are two archive photographs in the presentation that I have permission to show you, but not to disseminate more widely. And those are marked with a little Twitter logo with a red line through it. So if you did happen to take a photograph of any, not those two, but the rest, you know, whatever, it's all fair game. Okay. So just to be sure we all know, sarsenstone, sarsenstones are the one that make the really big trilithons and the lintled stone circle at Stonehenge. That's the material that I'm talking about today. <coughs> and this slide shows uh, a map with the general area of interest in North Wiltshire. It's a county in southern central or central southern England, depending on how you look at it. And the black rectangle on this map outlines the general area of interest that I'm speaking about the Marlborough Downs, and we're going to look at an area right in the middle of that black rectangle. And as you can see, it's mostly over the green on the map, so it's mostly over chalk, chalk uplands. And I'm going to tell you a story. And like all the best stories, it's set in a magical kingdom. So this is, we're in the magical, this is the magical kingdom that we're in. This slide shows this amazing view over the rolling green landscape of the Marlborough Downs looking over the Kennet Valley, uh, and this photograph includes one of the very few remaining large sarsen stones that's in this landscape. It's lying on the surface in a pasture field on Moncton Down. And my next slide is a photograph of one of the hidden valleys in the Marlborough Downs. This is a quiet coombe that's characteristic of the chalk, and this is called the Valley of Stones because the ground is covered with sarsen boulders. And the magical kingdom includes strange beasts. This one is very dear to my heart. This is a slide of a photograph of the toadstone, which is a really huge sarsen stone. It's about three meters tall, and it's shaped like a toad. I hope you agree, it's shaped like a toad. <coughs> But as well as being very beautiful, this is an industrial landscape. It's a massive quarry. It's spread over an area of at least 100 square kilometres. And this slide shows just a part of that. Um, it's an area of sarsen stone spreads on Fifield Down and Overton Down on the first edition Ordnance Survey map of 1889. So we now you can see from the inset map, we're now focused in right on a really small part of the Marlborough Downs. There were so many sarsen stones in the 19th century that the Ordnance Survey even mapped them. So all the speckles on this map, all the lines of speckles are dry valleys, the coombs filled with the stones, and speckles all over the fields covered in these stones. And in 1847, two men came into this landscape. There were two brothers, Enos Free, who was 25, and his brother Edward, who was 17. They travelled all the way from Buckinghamshire, which is north west of county northwest of london so they traveled all the way from buckinghamshire to wiltshire i've shown you photographs of wiltshire sarsen stones all lying about on the grass on the surface of the pasture but in buckinghamshire where you also find these stones they're buried in the thick clay with flints that lie on top of the chalk of the chiltern hills and there the sarsen quarrymen had to dig these stones out of the ground before splitting them up to make building blocks and street furniture. And sarsens make really hard wearing curb stones and sets. They're really brilliant for, for street furniture um, and for certain types of buildings. So this archive photograph 
shows one of these quarrymen standing on this huge block. It's been found by probing the ground with metal rods that they called snipers. <coughs> And then they dug, uh, they, they dug away the topsoil, uncovered the stone. And in Buckinghamshire, these sarsen cutters have developed a special set of tools <coughs> and the skills so that they could split these huge boulders in a controlled way, unlike earlier methods of breaking them up with fire and water, where you don't know what rubble you're going to get. But they could cut these in a controlled way. And they've been able to do that since at least 1800. And the products were sold under locality names like Denner Hillstone and Wickham stone. But boy was it hard work. They dug huge pits, sometimes 50 feet deep, that's about 17 metres or so, chasing the stones into this really thick superficial deposits over the bedrock geology. And this slide shows two of these sarsen cutters at the bottom of one of these pits. This is at a place called Walter's Ash. And they did the primary reduction at the bottom of the pit. You can see they've partially split this big boulder. And they wrapped chains around the pieces of rock and hauled them up to the surface using a winch suspended from an A-frame. And then on the surface, these big blocks were further broken down into smaller pieces to make the products that they then wanted to sell. So perhaps it's no surprise that these two young men, Enos and his brother Edward, decided to try their luck in Wiltshire where millions of sarsen stones lay scattered over the surface, like easy pickings. I'm going to quote you from the family history, which says this. They had come to Wiltshire because of the difficulties of making a living working the sarsen stone in Buckinghamshire. This stone was mainly only available below the surface, and the costs of searching for and digging out the stone became increasingly prohibitive. It is reasonable to assume great depth of character would have been revealed in persons making such a move into the unknown in the middle of the 19th century. Now, Enos died in 1858, aged 36, and his brother Edward died in 1875, aged 45. It was the silicosis that killed them. But Edward's wife Mary continued the business for the family, she employed members of two local families, the Kimmer and the White, uh, the Waits, sorry, families of stone cutters who learnt these special skills. And then Edward's son, William, developed the business. And large stone contracts were delivered in the 1880s. And then the Cartwright family came from Buckinghamshire. And the family history says this of them, no doubt attracted by the story of Edward Free's success. And by the early 1900s, the Free family was estimated to have an output of about 300 tonnes of cut stone per year. And the industry didn't close until 19, uh, 1939. So this all sounds really very successful. Enterprising young men who took a chance that paid off and resulted in a successful Wiltshire industry that ran for around 80 years before eventually new building materials and new ways of building roads and the austerities of the Second World War finally caused this part of the family business to come to an end. But the field archaeology, the field remains, speak almost entirely to the failed attempts to extract and cut the stone. An example in this slide, it's a large sarsen, it's split very neatly into three pieces, uh, the two blocks and the rest of the stone. Um, it's on Totterdown, which is at the northern end of our area of interest. And on the face of it, there's nothing wrong with this stone. The first three splits seem to be perfect, lovely straight lines. Um, they're, uh, they're perpendicular. Um, there's even a wedge hole prepared for a fourth cut, which I thought I'd circled, but clearly I haven't. Failure. Um, uh, but it's this little divot. They were going to make another cut, but they never used. Something went wrong here. And here's another one. In this slide, you can see a sarsen stone. It's about two metres long. It's got one really straight cut down the middle and two cuts in from the side, freeing up three blocks. But everything's been abandoned. It's just been left as though the quarrymen had simply walked away. But this stone is about five and a half kilometres to the southeast of the one in the previous slide. It's in a long coombe that runs through the middle of West Woods on the southern side of the Kennet Valley. It goes to show how big this quarry area was. 
But these aren't two isolated examples. There are hundreds, literally hundreds, of these abandoned, partially cut sarsen stones. So I thought I'd take one detail, uh, one area to look at in a little more detail. So you can hopefully see from the inset slide, we've really zoomed in onto one tiny, tiny little area. This slide shows an extract from the, uh, from the first edition of the Ordnance Survey Map for this area called Lockeridge Dean. Um, so it's another dry coombe in the chalk, and it used to be full of sarsen stones. And the Ordnance Survey mapped them. So you can see again there are the speckles, and then maybe you can make out grey weathers or sarsen stones is written in that script, wending its way through the coombe. Now there are some whole uncut sarsens in Lockeridge Dean, including an absolute monster that's at least five by five metres in size. It's huge. It wouldn't, wouldn't look out of place in Avebury. But many have been cut and abandoned, or cut and some bits taken away but the rest left. And there are even examples of sarsens that they tried to cut and failed to cut completely. And that's one of these. This slide shows one of these complete failures. It's not a particularly big sarsen stone, but the cutters clearly wanted to split the side of it off, and they pecked three holes in the top of the stone to take wedges that they had then been going to use to run a split through and break it up. Now, one of those three holes is empty. The other two have got wedges stuck in them, which I hope, despite the lichen and everything, you can see in this slide, it looks like the wedge holes were pecked out too deep. And the wedge on the right-hand side bottomed out. That means it got to the bottom of this wedge hole and actually it fell too far and they couldn't, there wasn't anything for them to actually strike. Because the wedge couldn't be hit with the hammer, it seems they left it. They didn't even try to put new wedges in or use the other wedges. They walked away. Not only did they walk away, but they left the wedges in there. So maybe they even got the width of the hole wrong and they, the wedges had jammed in and they couldn't even take them out. If we walk down Lockridge Dean from the entrance at the eastern end and we walk heading west, you go past a cottage called the Lacket, and the stones continue. So for the purpose of this presentation, I took a small sample area in the middle of Lockridge Dean to give you an idea of how many failed quarrying attempts there are. So the sample area is the polygon shown, uh, shown in red. It's about 70 <coughs> metres long and 30 or 35 metres wide. Now I chose this area pragmatically rather than scientifically. I didn't choose this randomly somewhere in the, in the Dean. And as you can see, it certainly wasn't laid out in a perfect rectangle. <laughs> but I was working on a short and cold winter's day and I decided to pick an area that I could see included cut and uncut stones, which I felt I could safely cover before the light failed. So that's the basis on which this sample area was, was taken. It's not the densest area of stones in Lockeridge Dean. Two or three of them are very big, most are medium sized. Of the 41 sarsen stones in this area, there were 12 that, because they had so much moss and lichen on them and were so overgrown, I couldn't <coughs> tell whether they had been cut or uncut, and I wasn't going to disturb that community around the sarsen stones. They're protected predominantly for their lichen coverage, which is quite rare, and it's really important to try to disturb these as little as possible. So there were 12 that I couldn't tell. Of the 29 left then, there were 17 that were uncut. They didn't appear to have ever tried to cut them and 12 that they tried to cut and failed and walked away from. So 41% of the ones that I could tell had been abandoned. The 17 uncut stones were passed by by the cutters for whatever reason, presumably applying their specialist knowledge of the stones. There were 17 that they hadn't even selected to try to cut by the time they left Lockeridge Dean. 12 though, they thought would be suitable for cutting and cutting started, but it was abandoned. Now, there are some archaeological issues to be resolved. For example, I don't have chronological control yet in an area like Lockeridge Dean. I don't know if the abandoned stones were good stones that failed or bad stones left over from earlier clearance and they thought they'd just have a go anyway and see what they could, what they could do. 
I don't know how typical a rate of failure this is over the whole of this huge quarry area over the Marlborough Downs. But bearing that in mind, all this failure, I think, is quite hard to square with this established and oft-repeated story of these enterprising young men who came to Wiltshire to quarry at Sarsen Stones. And that story tells us they came here because it would be so much easier and therefore more profitable to cut Sarsen Stones on the surface. But in the context of knowledge and skills, we can see evidence for regular failure in the business. And that, to me, suggests something about risk. And that has implications for other contexts of failure, such as industrial activity and commerce, where you have to be productive to serve and to grow your market. So I'm sure I'm coming to the end of my allotted time. So I'm going to wrap up. But this failure has led me to question this established Sarsen Stone story of these cutters moving from Buckinghamshire for easier, more profitable trade, and to wonder if it might be interpreted in a different way. But a monopoly has been held by this family history. Nobody's looked at this and nobody's written about it in any other way. And I think on examination, it seems to be bound up in some of the tropes of industrial archaeology that are similar to the ones that Luke Bennett has identified visiting the limestone quarries at Beer in Dorset. So, for example, in the Sarsen story, this human labour of these great risk-taking risk but resolute people has, uh, has achieved over, over matter, over the natural world. Whereas in the field, it looks a lot like the matter, the Sarsen stone, actually was really resistant. So in the spirit of Colin Richards and what he's written about building, uh, building megalithic monuments um, and, and trying not to frame them in functional terms, I'd like to be inspired by failure <laughs> to revisit the historical context and the detail of Sarsen quarrying. Um, some of the questions that I've got in mind is what happened in Buckinghamshire to send the cutters to Wiltshire? How did the business work? Because of course somebody owned this land, somebody owned the stones, somebody owned the mineral rights and there were big estates, big agricultural estates they were coming into. So what was the deal with that? And was there an ebb and flow? Did they come to Wiltshire and stay? Or in fact were they moving where they're going back to where their families were in Buckinghamshire. What was that all about? So I'd be interested to hear comments or reflections as I think about the theoretical frameworks through which I should approach this uh, part of my research. Um, and really, it just remains for me to say uh, thank you for listening and thank you for having me. Mm -hmm.